This is a video about a certain grandiosity in me and my work and my thinking that may be off-putting to some other professors, and I am very aware of that. And uh, so I want a video that deals with it right up front about it. Uh, first of all, uh, I was blessed with some great intellectual victories very early in life. Uh, not the biggest ones you've heard of and not big enough to get into the press, but big enough that some of the highest quality people in the world, and unambiguously so, uh, recognized me and my work and praised it and took concrete financial actions to support it. And that let me know that I was on a good track, that I wasn't uh, mentally deluded or lazy or biased excessively or uh, not contributing to society. And, and therefore, I developed uh, some confidence. Uh, for example, I had Robert Pinsky as a professor of modern English poetry at Wellesley College. And he had a, a first poetry assignment, which I did on my own way, which is really amateurishly and sloppily. And he gave me a, a failing grade on that and told me to redo the assignment as he assigned it, and which I did faithfully do. And uh, that got me into the core of what poetry is and uh, really doing a good job of it. And then my corrected version, he really loved. And uh, it wasn't the best student poem he had uh, read in his classes, but it was up there with the best. It was quite good, he said. And Pieces of it are going to, he said, uh, stay and reverberate in the language of my mind, and I'm sure uh, will appear in parts of my own expression in the future, because you have expressed a couple of things in these lines as good as anyone in the history of English, as far as I know, has. And that's the job. That's our job as a poet, is to keep the language vital and powerful by, uh, for every era, capturing, ex uh, inventing and crafting expressions that convey emotion, new emotions that people haven't had before and old emotions in new ways that keep them present and powerful and part make experience present to us to reflect on and improve. Uh, little events like that, Bruce McDonald, the head of the number one school district that sends students to Stanford, MIT, and Harvard every year, making me the very first uh, student teacher to be hired by Western schools. Uh, because he said, I'm totally incompetent as a teacher, uh, I was a young student at MIT, but my English in my spoken sentences was the most beautiful that he had ever heard in just someone's casual everyday talk, and he just wanted me as a background noise talking to him all day while he walked around the school, reminding him of how great the language was and what an immensely gorgeous, powerful, accurate tool it is. And uh, and therefore, to help inspire him to inspire generations of kids to fully use and realize the power and wonder of this tool. Uh, so I had lots of events like that, where some of the very best people in the world shocked me by being more interested in my work and, and aspects of my unconscious habits than I was. And that told me I was on track. And I've always gone back to expose myself to the best people of the world or simply to put my stuff out there and then find some of the best people in the world responding to it. Now, I've not become famous, and I've not sought fame, and I've not developed the avenues of fame, in part because the cost of that is uh, conforming your content and your expression means to what sells, and that requires a vast audience, which means dumbing it down, which is, and I already experienced that with McGraw-Hill, my publisher of my first two books. Uh, the editing process was basically a process of taking out anything in there that was sharp and that was uh, caused human growth and wiping that out because it would offend somebody who might buy the book and making sure that nothing in the book offended anyone or was negative about anyone. And then the version of my ideas that came out was a, a very wimpy, cognitive, you know, what you get in engineering schools where the, here's a nice little method for this and here's a little nice method for that or the Kennedy School of Government, here's a nice little model of this, and here's a little model of And the fact that as a collateral damage, this model kills 5 million people, that's a, just a cost of doing business. And then we go on, and this model has another side effect that kills 3 million people. That's just a part of having models. Models are imperfect. Besides, the 3 million people are in Southeast Asia, and who cares about them anyway? And so you end up with evil of the Eichmann in Jerusalem, Hannah Arendt book sort, creeping into Harvard elites, because they hide behind their models or their maths, because they are trained by professors for years 
in this neutral mindset of non-valence impacts of ideas. So the ideas are all neutral, philosophically neutral things, and they don't really kill people. Well, they do kill people, and they are not neutral emotionally. In fact, design ideas require the forebrain to unite major emotional valencing with cognition and concepts. And people with the lack of that emotional underpinning make fewer design decisions and their designs end up weaker. We now have research on this. And so the Kennedy School has a philosophy of teaching guaranteed to produce too few design decisions and inadequate designs of policies and laws. And that's the weakness in their current faculty. As long as they require 800 GRE math scores for students to get into the Kennedy School, they are going to be creating psychopaths hiding behind in math and models who don't know the boundary conditions around their models and much worse, don't care because they've been trained for years to not emotionally valence the impacts of ideas and concepts that they bandy around and the models that they use. And then when they have later, when they actually apply them and they're in government and they have five million dead Southeast Asians due to their policy, that's just the cost of doing business for Robert McNamara. Now, so Richard doesn't prescribe to all of that. Richard uh, is uh, extravagant in some ways. Um, we're at a time where the web is extravagant. And uh, we are at a time where the problems we have are extravagant. And uh, yet we have these little, uh, what do you call it, circumspect was Kierkegaard's word. These circumspect ways of thinking and educating our professionals uh, to make them look slick and competent and not scary and not extravagant. And, uh, and then they are failing to handle their problems. And we have elites drifting toward evil destroying the wealth of the entire American middle class in one year, 2008 and nine on Wall Street, uh, done by Harvard and University of Chicago religious guys who worship uh, economics and saying it's all economics, it's only economics, we don't need anything but economics, this is only economics, which is a religion promoted by their schools of business because their schools of business realize actually that economics doesn't work, that the uh, uh, Ken Arrow's Nobel Prize is for a piece of false math uh, that the topology doesn't add up when you actually include the Kahneman's research showing in 11 ways the human brain cannot maximize rational utility. And so the whole enterprise is on fake foundations, but any idiot knew that. I took 1401 at MIT 45 years ago from Paul Samuelson, and you could tell in three weeks in that basic economics course using his famous book, thought they are a Nobel Prize winner, you could tell that he was a liar to himself and to everyone else. That with those stupid, unrealistic assumptions about human nature, you can easily make your math work. Of course! You just assume humans are something vastly simpler than they are, and you can create a wonderful model which predicts lots and lots of things, except all the important things, like how do you get growth, and how do you care for people, and how do you pay for things, which... Uh, they left out of male economics for a hundred years in favor of calculating soybean prices. <laughs> Typical for males to concentrate on soybean pricing instead of on caring for people or growing the economy. And then you had to have Edith Penrose do the only major work for 50 years in economics on the economics of economic development and growth because all the males ignored that. Uh, just pitiful. But anyway, Richard thinks extravagantly because we are in extravagant times in terms of extravagant problems and extravagant new means and media in terms of the web, which is fundamentally changing the economics of uh, information delivery and use. And we don't know where it's going to take us. And we need some people who go as far outside boxes as our problems and our opportunities do. And I'm one of those. Now, uh, I am uh, convinced that a good university faculty and a good research lab leadership should be diverse. And so the last thing I want is a lot of people in the world like me. Uh, I think that would be a disaster. I am uh, trying to be a unique genera, and uh, that you can combine with more circumspect Kierkegaardian conventional types to make an interesting variety to put before students and uh, research customers. Uh, I'm not promoting my style as the right style. I think that's uh, adolescent behavior. Uh, but I am saying we need my type of uh, entity out there in the world as one option. And it's an important option, so it needs to be widely distributed. So I am moving a little bit toward more exposure in my old age because I, I see that uh, most institutions are so used to being circumspect 
that they really can't recruit and hire uh, people like me, and they certainly can't generate people like me uh, by people torturing assistant professors for seven years to publish petty papers like the Spanish and the Australians do, aping the Americans because they're not original enough to do things themselves. Australia had nice original thinking going on until five, seven years ago they started copying the American system, and they are solidly wiping out imagination and the uniqueness of Australian thinking by this stupid system of copying the Americans. And let's hope somebody has the guts to liberate Australia from their uh, recent uh, re rejection of their own creativity, which I find disgusting. It's a wonderful set of, of you know, Rodney Brooks came from Australia to MIT to change the approach to AI at MIT. And he didn't develop that by being a tortured assistant professor. He came through the Australian system before they started torturing their assistant professors like the Americans do. And, uh, and he revolutionized the approach, the American approach to AI because he didn't share the assumptions of those circumspect little cowardly American uh, guys who had been tortured for seven years writing petty little papers for even pettier little journals that no one reads. So we need uh, to operate on an imaginative scale that matches the scale of our problems and opportunities. And so if uh, you find me scary because I talk about casually creating 11 new sciences, I'm serious. I think we need those 11 new sciences, and since nobody else is creating them, God damn it, I'll do it. Uh, it's not that I'm trying to be extravagant. It's that we have so much work that needs to be done and nobody's doing it. What I'd like to do is create a new set of universities, uh, which has got three or four dimensions, each with 20 different kinds of departments, uh, that we don't have in current universities. I'd like people to be able to take the excellent sciences, any of the 54 of them, and the creativity and novelty sciences, any of the 18 of them, and the new sciences that I've talked about, about 20 of them, and then the traditional departments of five-dimension university. Well, right now, we, you know, you have the standard old 1,000-year-old uh, business law and medicine, uh, sociology, psychology, anthropology, political science, history, literature, philosophy, uh, et cetera, et cetera, physics, biology, chemistry, you have math. You have the same old categories from a hundred years, a thousand years ago. And, um, and those, they chop knowledge into those thousand year old categories and make generations of people cowardly, cowardly stupid uh, by doing that. It's not a good system. It's not working. It doesn't match the scale of our problems and our opportunities. It creates a lot of cowardly circumspect people hiding in models and maths that have collateral damage in the millions of dead people in unimportant parts of the world where we don't bother with the fact that we're killing them. And uh, so it creates evil. And uh, I think we need to stop doing the evil. I think we need to stop hiding behind models that have uh, dead people as collateral damage. I think we need to say that models without boundary conditions are tools of murder, and we need to be morally responsible to not to use and develop such models. We need to develop boundary conditions that make our models safe, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, I'm extravagant because our era is extravagant. I'm not extravagant, but just because I have hormones that make my brain visit the brain. Although there are, I do have a personality which laughs a lot. And I do have a personality which looks at the restrictions on thinking at the top universities I've been at, University of Chicago, MIT, Harvard, Wellesley. And uh, I just, it's pitiful the kind of thinking the faculty are doing. I came to MIT 45 years ago for computer science. And John Donovan's first assignment in his stupid 6251 course was, and I use the word stupid very accurately there. Uh, we all sat in the back row and laughed at him in that stupid course because his first assignment was writing a COBOL compiler in PL1. <laughs> I don't know. If you know computer science, you know how utterly stupid that was. It's like a junior high school assignment now. It's ridiculous. Not to mention that those are two of the dumbest computer languages ever invented by the mind of man. They are great for writing addresses on bank checks and nothing else. <laughs> it's sort of the bank clerk's view of the depths of com computation. And that was the first course, the entry level, 6251 in 1966, the entry level course in the computer science at MIT. And it just advertised that these faculty are idiots. They don't know anything about computer science. There must be someone in MIT who do, does know something about computer science. And it turned out to be Marvin Minsky and Drew McDermott and Carl Hewitt and these guys in Project Mac in this basement in Tech Square. And I spent five hours a night there for four years learning real computer science with the three grades that the graduate students gave, which is shit, not, uh, possible non-shit, and definite non-shit. And uh, you worked for months doing work for the graduate students, and you got shit, like unusable junk, 
or possible uh, non-shit, and then they'd investigate it, and the day later say, nope, it, this doesn't work, it's shit. And then occasionally, once every two months, you'd get one of the graduate students to say, hey, uh, you know, Green gave this thing last night, and I thought it was possible non-shit, and then I tested it last night, and it is non-shit, wow, and everybody would applaud it. That was the way you were graded. Uh, and basically, you, if uh, you did good work, then the graduate students used you, and if you didn't do good work, they didn't want you helping them because your help was more costly than having nobody there. Uh, but it was a great way to be educated, and uh, you had immediate, really clear explanations of errors and debugging of what you were doing, and uh, strategic advice on how to architect things, and uh, within weeks, you were architecting software in really clever ways and uh, that never were taught in any course at MIT, so it was a wonderful thing. I'm glad I found them, because, uh, boy, the computer science faculty were an utter waste of tuition. I don't know if that's true now, but, boy, in those days, they were. And the fact that artificial intelligence is now the entire agenda of computer science in most computer science departments indicates that there are a whole, not a whole lot of thinking has been going on the last 30 years in computer science, in spite of the fact that there are a lot of great jobs out there. Now, we at Xerox, we, I tried to hire good programmers produced by Stanford and MIT, and believe me, that's tough. We would have 60 people I had to interview to find one not harmful, non-jerk, not harmful idiot. On one non-idiot, I had to interview 60 people from Stanford and MIT. The, the quality of the people they produced was so bad. Uh, and I, it, you can, have to describe it to the faculty being deeply out of date and not having, not being practitioners and not knowing what the hell they're teaching. 